Hi, I'm Maddox. Uh, I'm Trenton. Our mentor is Dr. Celia Smith, and our research on, is on the distribution of waste in King Delta 15N in Grassler Salicornia, otherwise known as Gorilla Ogo, and Cody Medulli, otherwise known as Lima Bavai Iole, in Kanyawa Bay, and its effects on papillomatosis and colonomitis of the green sea turtle. I first became interested in this project in studying green sea turtles with papillomatosis when I went diving frequently in Kanyawa Bay and noticed large tumorous masses on these turtles and wanted to feel as though I could do something to help and understand this disease and what causes it. And since we were already, when we were already working together in a class, he pushed me with this topic. And since I'm a paddler, I see turtles dolphins, and manta rays all the time, so I really want to preserve the diversity I see. Oh. Ferropapillomatosis, or FP, is a turtle-affecting fatal tumor-causing disease and is the number one cause of mortality in the Hawaiian green sea turtles and sea turtles abroad. This disease is predominantly prevalent in Kanyohe Bay. Tumors can occur on the eyes, fins, or internal organs of of the green sea turtles, inhibiting their foraging and movement abilities, leading them to vulnerable to predation, um, entanglement in nets, and even susceptibility to harsh and irregular feeding habits. Well, as seen on map, there have been many isolated case studies of ferropapillomatosis causing turtle strandings not only in Hawaii, globally as well, primarily occurring, occurring in areas with a warmer climate. FP is a panzootic disease, and these tumors are caused by high levels of arginine, which triggers the latent herpes virus, which means that it does not affect the turtles until the consumption of this arginine-rich algae, meaning that turtles are practically eating themselves to death. This disease is caused by a herpes virus strain called clonid ferropapillomatosis associated herpes virus, known as clonid alpha herpes virus number five. The herpes virus has been found by many studies to occur in all marine turtles, even turtles that do not have ferropapillomatosis, and are considered by our, all standards to be clinically healthy. However, FP is triggered when the turtles consume this arginine-rich algae. Uh, for our research, we chose to focus on the invasive grass layer salicornia, commonly known as Gorilla Ogo, and the native algae Cody Medulli, otherwise known as Lima Bavai Iole. Grass layer salicornia is heavily abundant in Carnival Bay, and as seen on the left, is solid, brittle, and segmented. It was first seen in 1971 in Gila Bay, and then later in Kanyo and the Waikiki. However, it is now widespread in Hawaiian waters, thriving in the eutrophic environment. Eutrophication is an excess amount of nutrients in the water, leading to a lack of oxygen, killing sea life. Although these algae can be any spectrum of color, with the abundance of nutrients, all the pigments are produced, causing the algae to become black, as shown in the picture. This is evidence of the overabundance of nutrients in the bay. Cody medulla, as seen on the right, is a native green algae that lies in mats, commonly seen on the mid-portion of the reefs. Turtles have been shown to eat both these algae in previous studies. Previous research has shown that grassland salicornia experiences high levels of nitrogen, known as nitrogen loading in areas that are eutrophic or high in nutrients. This eutrophic environment that contributes to high levels of nitrogen in, uh, in the algae causes the algae to have high levels of the amino acid that we previously mentioned, arginine, a promoter of tissue growth, which is necessary to life. However, an excess arginine can be harmful and is needed to cause these tumors. Arginine triggers the herpes virus in the green sea turtles. So consequently, we believe that this contributes to the development of ferropapillomatosis and the tumors that so heavily impair the endangered green sea turtles. Uh, as seen in the map, Kanahe Bay has the highest amount of invasive algae on, on Oahu. The picture in the middle is white Kloloku fish pond, one of our sam sampling sites. When it's low tide, you can see, you can see the entire ground covered in grass soil salicornia, and there's bar and barely any other species of algae present. On the left is one such bunch of algae we picked up. One reason for such a high prevalence of grass soil salicornia in the fish pond area is the sewage force main right next to it, leading ni leaching nitrogen from effluent into the surrounding area of the coast. We chose Kaneohe Bay because there is an abundance of nutrients in the water that causes nearshore eutrophication and nitrogen loading in the algae. The bay itself is relatively stagnant due to the sandbar restricting intertidal exchanges, such that the water and the nutrients inside of it does not disperse easily into the open ocean, as the north and mid-bays do. With the restricted circulation of the bay due to the previously mentioned sandbars and reefs, paired with excess nutrients from the sewage force main and human activity near the nearshore areas, a nitrogen-rich environment is created. In this environment, because of the high levels of nutrients, invasive algae reproduce abundantly, covering entire nearshore flats and fringing reefs, as seen in the last picture, with mud-like, um, mat-like layers of algae that the green sea turtles feed on continuously, leading to a perpetual cycle of the green sea turtles consuming the arginine, and we believe the green sea turtles developing ferropapillomatosis. We use delta 50 n values in algae as indicators of wastewater. Delta 15 N is isotope ratio between nitrogen 15 isotope to nitrogen 14 isotope and is a wastewater specific indicator. The graph on the right shows that there is a strong correlation between total dissolved nitrogen as seen on the x axis on the right graph and the delta 15 N in treated wastewater as seen on the y axis. 
Furthermore, as shown in the graph on the left, our gene as seen in the y-axis has been linked to delta 15 n in the water as seen on the x-axis. However, there has not been a study finding a relationship between delta 15 n to fear papillomatosis. Biological processes change the ratio between nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14. Organic matter in sewage has a different ratio of nitrogen than the naturally occurring ratio, ratio in the ocean, meaning that when effluent is released, organic matter in the ocean has to, has to absorb X nitrogen 15 to something to balance the nitrogen in the ocean. A previous feature, research guessed that there is a link between eutrophication and arginine in the algae. The higher the amount of eutrophication, the higher amount of arginine in the dry mass of algae. This data led us to our research question. Our research question is, does wastewater indicated by high levels of delta 15N levels in Gracera siliconia and Cota medulla in Cano Hebe show a link to ferropapillomatosis in Colonia Mylas or the endangered green sea turtle? Our research was split into two parts. There was a measurement of delta 15N levels in Cano Hebe in the algae and the rates of ferropapillomatosis amongst the green sea turtle population in Cano Hebe. We hypothesized that the higher the levels of nitrogen in the algae, the higher the rates of ferropapillomatosis are in the turtles in the corresponding bay. It is important to note that these tumors caused by ferropapillomatosis are not cancerous, but are really a proliferation of tissue. However, its effects have the potential to kill and cause great harm to these endangered turtles. The purpose of this study was to look at the rates of tumors in relation to nitrogen indicated by wastewater in the bay. This would help us learn more about the nitrogen pollution that has occurred in the Bay and worldwide, as well as give us an idea of the causes and distribution of ferropapillomatosis in Kanyohe Bay and throughout our entire island. So our first part of research was on the algae. Uh, the sampling process for the algae was accomplished in multiple sampling areas, the North Bay and South Bay, as seen on the map, in arc map. And we made arc maps. Each point of the map represents a triplicated algae collected with 60 total samples. At the South Bay, there's an overabundance of grassland salicornia and was evidence of the wastewater output in the area. These samples were collected in order to analyze delta 15 n values. In the South Bay, there's a high prevalence of invasive algae due to previously mentioned sewage works main leaking excess nutrients into the bay. The Kanye Bay stream was also adjacent to a sampling site that exposed runoff and sediment from residential areas. The lack of water flow in the bay due to reef, due to reef trapping effluent does not let nutrients and sediment flush out from these pollutant sources and subsequently cause eutrophic conditions. This leads to overgrowth of grass layer salicornia. The picture shows the overgrowth by white flow located fish pond in the South Bay adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, after we collected the samples, the grass of salicornia were taken to Dr. Smith's lab at the University of Hawaii Manoa to be prepared and dried. After all the unusable parts of the algae were removed and the algae was cleaned, the samples were then wrapped in aluminum foil and labeled accordingly. And once all uh, samples were wrapped in aluminum foil, they were dried in the oven at 70 degrees Celsius for three days. Uh, once dried, the algae was ground and in a mortar and pestle. Then each sample was prepared and sent to the biogeochemical stable isotope facility at the University of Hawaii Manoa in order to determine the delta 15 n values of each algae. Uh, locations, with the locations with algae tissue with delta 15 n value of greater than 6 are considered wastewater dominated. Algae tissue with delta 15 n value of 4.0 to 5.99 are considered wastewater influenced and, occasion and have occasional exposure. And those below that with 4.0 4 and less are considered negligible influence. In the South Bay, this is wastewater dominant with an average of 7.1. However, the near shore site, the fish pond, had an average of 9.4. In the mid bay, an average delta 15 n average of 3.7, showing to be negligibly reflected by wastewater. The initial value at Iakea Harbor was 4.1. The squares represent triplicates of Cody Medulae that we found. We found two points of native algae in the, in the mid bay. In the north bay, its total average was 4.3, making an application of wastewater influence. However, we could not have a near shore site due to, like the other two sites, due to a lack of an area with human activity, such as a fish pond and boat harbor. Oh uh, yeah, so here are map values of the three sites and the corresponding delta 15 n values with a total of 60 total samples. Uh, here's a bar graph of all our results. We conducted a t-test on the bays to ensure that the bays were statistically dependent from each other. And from this, we determined that when comparing the mid and north bay, they were not statistically different. However, when comparing the mid and south bay, as well as the north and south bay, it is a statistical difference. In each bay, there's mostly a trend of the further away from human activity or shoreline, the lesser delta 15 n value would be. The second part of our study that we will be looking at is the green sea turtles in Kanyohe Bay and the rates of ferropapillomatosis amongst these turtles. As you can see here, this represents a heat map of the data that we collected or the green sea turtles that we censused, with a total number of turtles being 59. The shading represents the distribution of the green sea turtles in the mid, north, and south bay, the south bay being the red at the bottom, the mid bay being the yellow in the middle, and the orange being the north bay at the top. In order to determine that each of the turtle populations in each of the respective bays were different and were not um, combining, we conducted a test by looking at uh, one turtle that we tracked throughout our study to determine if the turtles went from bay to bay or if they stayed in the same bay. 
And throughout the entire study, we found that turtles that were in one bay only stayed in that bay. So we can conclude that there are different turtle populations, and therefore we can determine that the, the ferropapillomatosis rates in each of the different bays are individual and distinct of each other. So in order to conduct this study, we first used drones to look at each of the bays and determine where the turtle populations were exactly. And this was used because we could not simply um, have the manpower to look through the entire bay. So we wanted to narrow down where we should put our underwater cameras and dive for the green sea turtles. Once we located an area that was suitable for diving for the green sea turtles, where there was a high abundance of these turtles, we then went underwater and dove with underwater cameras to take pictures of these turtles, as well as set up um, underwater cameras on the reefs of Kanyohe Bay in order to determine um, where the turtles were and the populations in a long-term um, environment. With this, we concluded if the turtle did or did not have ferropapillomatosis based upon if they did or did not have a tumor on them in the photo that we took. And then we also identified and made a separate fingerprint-like ID for each turtle based upon the shell patterns of the turtles, which are distinct amongst every single turtle. Um, therefore, we can determine that we only counted each turtle one time. As you can see here, this is a demonstration of a green sea turtle that is healthy, as you can see on the left, and a green sea turtle that has a ferropapillomatosis tumor, as you can see on the right. As you might guess, the ferropapillomatosis tumor engulfs the entire eye of the green sea turtle and therefore would most likely inhibit its ability to defend itself from predation, as well as increase its susceptibility to impaired foraging. The turtle on the left appears clinically healthy and does not have any of these issues. These are the results of ferropapillomatosis that we got from each turtle from the turtle populations in each of the three bays. With the North Bay having 11 out of 38 turtles with ferropapillomatosis, or 25%, the Mid Bay having three out of 15 turtles with FP, or 20%, in the Mid Bay having a in the I'm sorry, in the South Bay having a staggering six out of six or 100% of the turtles with ferropapillomatosis. This is a bar graph demonstrating the levels of ferropapillomatosis in the bay. As you can see, the green represents the healthy turtles and the orange represents the turtles that have ferropapillomatosis. As you can see here, there is no statistical significance between the North Bay and the Mid Bay, as we saw in the nitrogen delta 15 values, which would likely be because of the similar nitrogen delta 15 rates, which implies that the green sea turtles have ferropapillomatosis at um, similar rates. Whereas the South Bay and the Mid Bay, as well as the South Bay and the North Bay, show statistical significance using the Fisher's exact test which means that the ferropapillomatosis is dependent upon an environmental factor in these bays. This is a comparison of the two graphs, the nitrogen delta 15 value graphs and the ferropapillomatosis graph. And as you can see here, the South Bay in both of these graphs has a, a significantly higher amount, um, higher rate, and then either the mid bay or the north bay. And with this, we can conclude that this data suggests there is a significant relationship between macroalgae exposed to wastewater, nitrogen, and ferropapillomatosis in green sea turtles, meaning that we suggest that there is a link between wastewater and ferropapillomatosis in green sea turtles. Uh, yeah, so this research suggests that there is a relationship between macroalgae exposed to wastewater and high levels of nitrogen and ferropapillomatosis in green sea turtles. The levels of ferropapillomatosis amongst green sea turtles where nitrogen, nitrogen is are high is higher, such as in South Bay, and the levels of where, of where ferropapillomatosis amongst green sea turtles is opposite, where delta 15 end values are lower. However, this does not show the exact cause of the disease. Green sea turtles are considered endangered and are a great risk for FP. These turtles play a valuable role in the ocean's ecosystem as they are a keystone species and I would not be Hawaii without them. This research could help mitigate the main factor that's killing them and causing their population to decline worldwide. Some future steps that we are looking into taking for our research and continuation of our research would be to expand the study to other bays and to other areas where there is a high turtle population in order to validate our results and to see if uh, wastewater is really the cause of ferropapillomatosis. Another future step that we are looking into is determining the diet of green sea turtles and to see if algae has an impact on whether fer um, turtles have higher or lower rates of ferropapillomatosis using eDNA from um, turtle feces. Some future advice that we would give to um, new researchers and people pursuing uh, independent research honors, decay fellowship, and even AP research um, is to be um, very motivated and passionate about your project and about your study, because this alone will drive you to your A or B in the class, as well as allow you um, to see how far you would like to pursue your research. Because if you're not motivated with a research topic, um, you'll most likely burn out. And because there are many challenges that we face throughout our course and throughout the research in general.
Yeah, we'd also like to thank Dr. Chan, Dr. Smith, and Ms. Kobayashi for providing their guidance expertise throughout the study. We'd also like to thank Mrs. Walgrove, Walsgrove, the lab manager at the Biogeochemical Stable Isotope Facility, for analyzing our algae samples for Delta 15N. We want to thank the Jungs for allowing us to use their boat to help us collect samples around Kanye Bay. We thank Yolani for endowing us with their funding. And, and lastly, we're thankful to our families for being overall support system for us and without whom our research would not be possible. Thank you. Thank you.